Hey everyone, me Kevin here. Boy, oh boy, I'm a little bit nervous about the Fed meeting this week. Look, we're today, as of this morning, like right now, we're at 62.5% chance of a 50 basis point cut at the Wednesday Fed meeting. But I'm not so worried about the 50 or 25. I'm actually more worried about the market reaction. I'll explain. This will make sense in a moment. Uh, but first, I do think it's worth clearing up that yes, if we want or if the Fed wants us to believe that we're going to get a 50 basis point cut, then they're not going to send their cronies like former Fed officials or people connected to them like Nick T at the Wall Street Journal. They're not going to send them to talk markets down to a 25. They'll be okay with us leaning towards 50. If anything, I actually think we're more likely to get more of the Nick T's and the Bill Dudley's leaning towards 50 because that's what the Fed wants. So I think we've got another about 50 hours or so left. No, not for an expiring coupon code this moment. There is no coupon code. Can you believe I'm saying that? There's no coupon code right now. Uh, and uh, you've got another about 50 hours before you get to Fed decision. So you're just on standby and you've got this time to let markets keep pricing in more and more of that 50 BP cut. Maybe you even get another piece out from Nick T or Bloomberg or whatever that says, yeah, 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 50. And it moves this even more in that direction, which should bring bond yields down, bond prices up. And markets, like stocks, well, we're going to talk about that as well as Bitcoin. So you've got the Fed likely to push us towards 50. But there's a problem with all of this. And I want to start not with what's going to happen right after the Fed cuts, because that's going to be a little bit more speculative. But instead, what do you have to look forward to? And this actually makes me the most nervous. I want you to think about this for a moment. Everybody is talking about the Fed right now. And that's always what I try to do on this channel. I'm trying to get you to think different, right? See, like Apple, think different. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we could have a debate in the comments about the grammar of is it think differently, like the action in which I think is different, or am I thinking of things that are different, like is the subject different? I am thinking of different. <laughs> uh, anyway, so after the Fed, because every financial pundit is the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, it's like SpongeBob and everything's on fire. After is what matters. Because after the Fed meeting, what do you guaranteed have? In my opinion, pure uncertainty. Because think about it. Whether the Fed goes 25 or 50 ain't going to make a freaking big deal in the long term. What the Fed says on the SCP ain't going to make a big deal in the long term. It's always wrong anyway. So then, okay, Fed meeting happens. We either get 25 or 50. We'll speculate that on the moment. We'll get a SEP. We'll talk about that in a moment. But then what do we look forward to? Oh, no. We have four weeks until Q3 earnings come out. Oh, well, what if we get Adobe'd? Remember Adobe was down like eight and a half percent when it got Adobe'd on Friday because their software always crashes on my computer. Uh, anyway, it was down like 8.45% or whatever on Friday. It's down 1.3% now uh, on the day so far. And bad earnings could really start resetting valuations lower and then you start the trend going lower, especially in an environment where pricing power is waning. You know, we've done a, quite a bit of analysis on restoration hardware over the past year in the course member lives. And we found that uh, they've always been very stubborn about reducing prices and their valuation was actually very, very low. Now, what's actually interesting is they just had a stock market pop. And when we dug deep into the weeds of their earnings, we're like, wait a minute, their gross margin just fell 40%. They're slashing prices like crazy at restoration hardware because they're getting smart PP. And nobody wants small PP. It's like you have hard PP for a little bit and, you know, good pricing power because of, uh, you know, all the stimulus, all the COVID. Uh, and, uh, and, and then all of a sudden, it just sort of like fizzles out and fades away. It's kind of sad. It's like you need something to boost you up again, but they don't have that uh, at Restoration Hardware. It's, it's actually very bad now. <laughs> like it went from being undervalued and good to now we're like, oh my gosh, this is highly not good. But anyway, so you get Q3 earnings, then you have six weeks until the election, and then you actually have six weeks and about two days until the next Fed meeting. So all of a sudden, all you're really doing is delaying more certainty. Because let me ask you this. Do you actually think the Federal Reserve today has any freaking clue as to whether we're going to stick a soft landing or a recession? Of course not. It's, it's literally unknowable right now. It is, it is unknowable.
Now, I know a lot of people are like, oh, Kevin, we're already in a recession. Other people's like, no, everything's going to all time high. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Fed. What do we, you can have your opinion. What does the Fed think? They don't know. And so this is the problem with the rate cuts this week is if you get 25, you're going to get markets that go, yo, why the hell are you flirting with recession? Hole. <laughs> and then if you get 50, you're going to get people go, man, why are you so scared, bro? Like there is a bullish scenario where it's like, all right, rate cut cycle is getting started. The stock's to the moon. Dude, that's already what we've seen so far. Like we've been pricing in the rate cut cycle starting for like a year and a half. Coming up on two years, we have been pricing in. Rates are going to come down soon. That's why real estate market has stayed up. That's why stocks have gone up because we've already been pre-pricing in. And we've already pre-priced in 250 basis points of cuts. Who cares if it's 50 now or 25? We've already priced in 10, 25 basis point cuts. It doesn't freaking matter in the long term. But in the short term, markets want to know, hey, can you give us some guidance? Like, are we going to a recession or are we still Gucci on the soft landing here? I don't think the Fed's going to answer that. I think they're going to lean 60% in favor of, hey, labor market is weakening. We want to stop this and 40%, but we're not done with the inflation fight. So, you know, we have some work to do. The, the risks are tilted a little bit towards the side of the labor market weakening further. And remember, once you start getting the labor market weakening, it doesn't stop. Bill Dudley talked about this. So I'm going to go through what Bill Dudley and them just said. But if you're thinking that you're going to get certainty after the Fed, I think you're sadly mistaken. You're going into fear that earnings are coming up and then earnings come out and then the election and then the next Fed meeting. Like, that, oh, oh, is the, okay, this one was a 50. What, what, is the next one going to be 50 again or is it going to be 25? Oh, we're dirt dirt dependent. Just getting more uncertainty. Now, in fairness, we had good news today. Empire Manufacturing came in strong. Uh, it was expected to come in negative. It came in at 11.5, which is great. You had shipments growing significantly, but that's only New York State. So, you know, it's not like super useful for the entire United States, but it's an indicator, right? Firms grew more optimistic, they noted. Although at the same time as you got that information, you heard that the Apple pre-order demand for the iPhone 16 is uh, significantly uh, lower uh, than expected. Uh, JP Morgan thinks so. Meeching Ku or whatever thinks so. They're... Um, apparently a reliable Mac analyst. You've got JP Morgan thinking. All, all of them together are like, yeah, no, this one's just not gonna really push people to buy the new iPhone, okay? So, so that drags the indices down. You know, Apple down almost 3%, indices go down. Great, what happens when indices go down? They start a downtrend and they keep going down more. The queues get rejected off, you know, 476, great. Now we go back to 460, then we go to 438, and it just sucks. So then we got that push from Bill Dudley today where Bill Dudley says the Fed should go big and I think it will. Okay, so he's putting his credibility on them going 50 and he used to work at the Fed. He worked at the Fed for what, like over 10 years? Uh, almost 10 years, it was nine years, 2009 to 2018. So uh, he says the unemployment rate uh, is up 0.8%. We're at the slowest payroll employment increases over the last three months since COVID. Wage inflation is low under 4%. PC is around two and a half percent, which ain't that bad. And the slight beat on inflation readings we saw last week were because of insurance and shelter and, you know, Kevin here interjecting also some travel and lodging, which is a little bit more volatile. The problem, he says, is that unemployment losses tend to be self-reinforcing. And so the way to think about this is with inflation, you don't have this like flywheel effect where like once you're going, you keep going with labor layoffs or a lack of hiring you do. Because less hiring begets less consumer spending, which begets less hiring. That inertial movement is bad. It's not good. It's like an object that stays, uh, an object in motion stays in motion, right? That really applies to the labor market. So he references that every time we've seen more than a half percentage point increase uh, in the lows from the prior 12 months of the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate has gone up at least 1.9% and we've had a recession. And so, yes, the labor force has expanded, but at some point you're going to hit the tip of an iceberg and then you're going to come down. Now, we've seen that tip of the iceberg already to some extent. Now, this is a this one's a little bit more complicated, but basically you could look at peak private uh, employment and then you could look at peak education and healthcare employment. And usually what you find uh, is one peaks after the other and then you have a recession here. Look on screen here. Okay. 
So this is uh, from a few days ago. What was it? This was like on August 30th. So I posted this chart here. Peak, uh, what is this? The dark blue line, peak government and private and healthcare services sectors peaking after the private sector has peaked has often led to a recession. It did so here, 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 uh, and here. So pretty much every time it's peaked, it's led to a recession with the notable exception of 1995 soft landing. <laughs> It's the only time we've had a soft landing. Now, you know, obviously, if you look at today's yield curve inversion and you convert it and you, you compare it to 1995, the yield curve is like, dude, don't even talk to me about 1995. 1995 is quite literally the opposite of where we've been with the yield curve inversion. You can see that very clearly here, because if you go to 1995, which is right here, you didn't actually have an inverted yield curve. You didn't have an inverted yield curve in 95. You didn't have one in 94. You didn't have one in 96. You didn't have an inverted yield curve until 1998. And that was your signal for the dot-com recession. But look at the magnitude, like this line right here where my mouse is. That's how low we got in the 80s and uh, over here in the, uh, in the post-COVID era. This signals that massive rate cuts need to come. This signals that rates might actually have to go to zero, like 500 basis points of cuts, just to try to get us back to expansion and a really positive sloping yield curve where we can foster growth. Like for us to get this yield curve back to positive, you know, two or three percent, we're just basically gonna have to turn the money printer on. You know, obviously there, there are always the short term risk of like a, a shock, but that's why you turn the money printer on to solve the shock, right? So uh, that's not good. The bond market is like, no, 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 this is, this is not Gucci. This is bad. Uh, but of course, ev not every, not, there's no one signal that's blurry. Somebody asked me this morning, like, hey, well, is there any good news out there? Yeah, sure there is. Uh, manufacturing slowly starting to pick up in the United States. You've had cycles of recession that didn't all come at the same time, like you had your freight recession, although you still haven't fully recovered from that. You had your chips recession in November of 22. But uh, you had good empire data this morning. You have uh, ISM services that are positive. You still have relatively low unemployment. You know, 4.2% is still really good historically. Uh, obviously, the AI chip spending it continues to go on, and you've got pockets of pain where people have taken on debt where they probably shouldn't have. They don't actually have the ability to repay the debt they've taken on. Yeah, there are issues in the economy. Are they screaming, we're definitely in a recession? No. And there are plenty of things to counter that we're not in a recession maybe at this point. We might be because they tell you after the fact, right? We, the recession could have already started. We don't know. Uh, but that's because for you to really confirm that you're definitely in a recession, you need the jobs to roll over. Okay, well, once the jobs roll over, it's too late. And, you know, th then, then you're already talking Fed capitulation. We know we're not at Fed capitulation yet because the Fed hasn't capitulated anything. We're just barely at the start of the rate cutting cycle. Start of the rate cutting cycle is bullish apps in a recession. It's very bearish in a recession. Uh, and then you really don't want to invest until the Fed fully capitulates. But um, my take here is that this Fed meeting, sadly, is just not actually going to help us that much because we're not getting any new data. We're just basically getting, you know, daddy coming into the room going, we're going to wait for more data. <laughs> it's like, oh, damn it. No, obviously we're going to cover it. We're going to scrutinize it. And really what we're looking for, like my, in my opinion, the Fed's going to go 50 and lean dovish. And, and, you know, this is based on their last messaging over the last two or three days. So they go 50 and probably lean a little on the dovish side. And then they want to see how the market reacts. Well, what if the market sells off? Because it's like, shoot, the Fed's already starting to panic. You know, you see like the nervousness in Powell. The markets will freak out. If markets are like, you know, if, if Jay Powell's up there, it's like, everything's great. And we're going 50. Then people are going to go, you're a liar. Sell. So it's kind of like if he goes up there and says, things are bad. Market sells off, you have a recession. If he goes up there and says, everything's great, markets sell off because they're like, you're full of shit. If he's like, hey, things are okay. You know, there are risks to the downside. We're okay-ish now, but we got to get moving. I don't know. It's kind of a crapshoot as to what's going to happen in the markets. I think what you do, and this is my take, this is what I would lean. I lean bearish. I'm not short the market, but I lean bearish because 
you're not going to get any certainty out of it. You know, people are going to look at that and go, man, I'd rather you just tell me we're in a recession. Or I'd rather you tell me we're not than tell me, I don't know, we might be. So we're just going to go 50 and uh, be data dependent. Well, then people are going to go, damn it. Okay, well, what's the next data? Oh, okay. I have to wait until early October to get jobs and CPI again. I have to wait until mid-October to get earnings. Oh, I have to wait for that election to happen. Volatility has a extremely high likelihood of skyrocketing over the next six weeks. And frankly, I think the upside risk to stocks is very, very, very low. So, uh, you know, people ask me, they're like, oh, but, you know, I, 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 I see the comment. You know, people are like, oh, but Kevin, you're just going to sit out and you're going to miss out. Yeah, 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 you're a loser. It's like, okay, well, first of all, uh, just because I go bearish in July and I want to be bearish until the election or like right before the election doesn't mean I'm going to sit out forever. It just means I'm, a, I'm taking a little break. You know, that's the way I look at it. It's like I'm taking a little bench break. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to chill a little bit. Now, how do I chill? Well, I mean, we talk about that in the course member live streams. You know, we went through some of our price targets and some things that uh, that we find attractive right now. But uh, look, I'm uh, you know, I'm a long stocks kind of guy. I'm bullish the vast majority of the time. I am bullish. I'm just unfortunately the, the risks are so high right now that markets are just not going to be satisfied with anything the Fed gives us that frankly you're probably just inviting a whole lot of volatility because no, like the Fed cannot give you certainty. So if the Fed definitely cannot give you certainty, what are they basically going to give us? Uncertainty. And what does the stock market sell off on? Uncertainty. And so that's the thing. Like the best news I think is priced in. The worst news is not. And nobody's even thinking past the Fed right now because all finance media, nah, 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 it's Fed. Okay. So, so then I look, well, long-term view, you know, I mean, if I'm in this, if I'm looking, I've got a, you know, a, a 20, 30 year portfolio or whatever to run. I don't really care if it's 50 or 25. 20 or 30 year portfolio, I'm looking at October to buy the dip in the near term. And then I'm looking, cool, how do I position myself to be long the best companies in the world? Amazon, Apple, Nvidia, Tesla, Enphase, you know, like the good OGs, right? That's just like, but you balance that basket. Like you don't go all in on one, you balance that basket with, okay, now let's get some bonds in the portfolio. Let's have some cash so we can go buy real estate. Let's go buy real estate. What else can we diversify into? Not for the sake of diversification, but frankly, for the sake of building lasting wealth. You know, everybody can get rich in a stock market bull market, but then you got to actually either sustain income or you got to not lose a load of money. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's my take. I think the upside's pretty limited. And, and it's gotten even worse now because you have rallied a bit, right? So look at the cues. So like for people asking today specifically, like, oh, you know what? Well, what about investing in the NASDAQ uh, today? Well, I mean, look, you know, at the beginning of August, you were sitting over here at 438. You've already gone up from there. 473 divided by 438. From that bottom, you're already up 8%. So now from peak, 503.52 divided by 473, let's say, you're about 12% away from peak. So then you look and go, oh, okay, well, I think we're going to go way past peak. Okay, fine. I mean, I, I think that's very risky. Oops, sorry, I did the math wrong. You're, oh, no, 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 sorry. You're only 6.5% from peak. So you only potentially have 6.5% to go to peak. And I think it gets even harder as you get closer and closer to the queues. Like, why would you do that? Uh, again, you have to believe soft landing guaranteed. So you've already had your bounce. So now you wonder, well, are we just in an environment where we're going to make lower highs like we are on the queues, like we are on NVIDIA, where you're making these lower highs and you just have a big correction coming up ahead? Well, that actually makes this potentially a good place to go, okay, yeah, I'm going to trim a little bit. I'm just going to sit out the uncertainty for the next week. Fine. If there's if it's soft landing post-election, great. I don't know. That's, uh, that, that's just mi opinion. Anyway, so uh, that's my take on the Fed. I, I'm, I'm not so terribly optimistic that the outcome is going to be great. I'm going to go 50 because I think that's what they're massaging the messaging into right now. So the market was pricing in 25 and then the Fed quickly U-turned on that. So I think we get 50. I think we get dovishness, but no guarantees, which leads to uncertainty, which potentially leads to sell-off. 
uh, especially going into the next catalyst. Now, with all of that said, I want to thank you very much for being here. Um, this is not sponsored, but take a look at what somebody gifted me. Uh, and you can also go see this stuff when I post it on um, Meet Kevin on Instagram. Follow me at Meet Kevin on Instagram. I'll post stories. You can see the kids and summer stuff. But look at this. Somebody gifted me this. And I thought it was so cool because that's like my slogan in the courses and stuff. Next, Meet Kevin with the American flag. And it's so funny because I was in the market for something like this. And uh, it's a really nice uh, sort of pocket knife here. Again, not sponsored. Honestly, this I'm pretty sure these were sitting in the back of my car for like a month. Uh, because I got a package and I just kind of forgot about it. Uh, and I didn't ask for this. I don't know these people, you know, they could suck. But honestly, um, I, I, I kind of like it. I like the quality. Uh, here it is. Palmetto, wood shop, and engraving. I didn't even know you could get these customized. Again, not, not sponsored. I didn't ask for this. Uh, this is really cool, though. I, I thought it was really nice that they did this. It's, um, you know, I kind of like the black on the little belt clip, too, because I... I I, a lot of people have the silver one here and it's just, it just so obvious. It screams like, that guy's got a knife. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not a big deal. Uh, and check to make sure they're legal in your state, obviously. Keep them away from children. But anyway, if you want uh, sound financial advice from a dude with a free pocket knife, make sure... Is it considered brandishing if I'm pointing it at you in a video? Make sure to go to stockhack.com. <laughs> Find out how we can provide you personalized, actual financial advice and make sure you're on the right path to long-term wealth building, not speculation. Stockhack.com. Pretty nice. We'll put that right next to the house hack. 45. Not advertise these things that you told us here. I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, licensed real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is not personalized advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show shall not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purposes of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services we may benefit from. I also personally operate an actively managed ETF. I may personally hold or otherwise hold law long or short positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuer other than Hack, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Make sure if you're considering investing in Hack to always read the PPM at Hack.com.